Hello, everyone. Tony from Hack the Movies here, and I have the uh, gentleman from Dead Mouse Productions, right? Uh, and today we're going to talk about how to make film documentaries because you guys would know a thing or two about that. Um, but yes, uh, how about you guys introduce yourselves uh, going down the, the list here? I wish I just thought. Uh, oh, uh, I guess, yeah, yeah, Gary. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, my name's Gary Smart. I'm a uh, producer <clears throat> of RoboDoc and a few other projects and also one of the co-directors of Cool Screenings UK Limited and Dead Nights Productions. Cool. And I'm Christopher Griffiths, co-director of RoboDoc, uh, Hollywood Dreams and Nightmares, Pennywise, The Story of It, You're So Cool Bruce, The Story of Friday Night, <gasps> and Leviathan, The Story of Hellraiser and Hellbound Hellraiser 2. Ooh. Well done, you did pretty well there. And I'm Eastwood Allen. I am the co-writer, director, co-writer, co-director of RoboDoc, the uh, creation of RoboCop, and the editor. And I've helped these guys edit a load of other documentaries too, or been involved in some capacity. Nice. And we're going to talk about the documentaries. I uh, just want to let everyone know in the chat, if you have a specific question you want asked that mm. might not be on my list, uh, feel free to leave a super chat. Or if you just want to leave a super chat to get us to say something within reason, within reason, okay? Don't ask why they haven't made the Dark Knight Rises documentary since I am an uncredited extra. Uh, they're not going to answer that stuff, okay? <laughs> Spoiler, if you ever make a documentary, I will talk at length about the football scene that you can't see me in. I will talk for <laughs> 10 hours about that. <laughs> you could be like, we couldn't get Christian Bale, but we got the guy that you can't see in the shot. <laughs> Yeah, we're used to doing that. You like a jersey? Did you get one of the Under Armour jerseys, the Gotham Gotham jerseys? Oh no, no, no. I was one of the unpaid, uncredited right. uh, yeah. guys in the stands. <laughs> I, I had to bring my own. I got to keep the yellow handkerchief. It's on set. That's that's the most I got to keep from that. Um, speaking of, uh, real quick, uh, just to give, get a few plugs out of here uh, on Patreon right now. Monday's episode is what is the worst Halloween three which is technically Halloween 4, Halloween H2O, Halloween Kills, and Halloween 3. Uh, that is up early on Patreon. You can watch it right now and let me know what I got wrong. People have already told me mistakes I made in the episode. I've already made changes. And if you want to see me coming up, I will be at Spookala in Tampa, Florida, October 6th to 8th, and I will be at Monster Mania Con in November. Now, let's get on with it. You guys made a couple movies here. I watched three of them. Uh, and I have some questions about them, but real quick, like you said, you guys did Pennywise, the story of it, which is about the made for TV it movie from the nineties, uh, which I love. I love that. Uh, I, th that movie has led to a shouting match between me and my mother. Um, years ago, the movie was on, right. And I told my mom like, Hey mom, it's on. And then she looked at me and she said, what's on. And then I realized she didn't get it. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, mom, mom, it's on. And she's like, what's on? And I'm like, if I do this enough, she'll finally figure it out, right? <laughs> this went on for three minutes until it finally ended with her screaming at me. She's like, will you just tell me what is on? I'm like, yeah, the movie It with the clown. And she was like, oh, oh, you're an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> um, you guys also did the documentary, like you said, Hollywood Dreams and Nightwares about Robert Anglin. And of course, the newest one, RoboDoc. So I have some questions. On how you make these wonderful films. Um, first off, how did you guys get started with documentaries? How did you get involved in making those? I'll leave that one to mum. Come on, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I did a short version because it's, it's, it's 10 years old. Uh, okay. um, I'd done a couple of books. Uh, sorry, one book in particular on uh, Return of the Living Dead. Uh, the Complete History of Return of the Living Dead. Published Ooh. in the UK and the US. That was with a guy called Christian Sellers. Um I was then asked to write the documentary More Brains, a story of Return of the Living Dead. Uh, and that was obviously with Mikey Perez and Tommy Hudson, who'd worked on Never Sleep Again, Crystal Lake Memories. Long story short, I then did a screening in the UK uh, of uh, Return of the Living Dead and the animator. And we invited the actor Don Kaifer, who was a close friend, to come over to the UK to do a Q&A. Chris came along as, as a paying kind of punter. To that um and then we got kind of friendly got chatting he, came he invited me into the dressing room actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> he invited me backstage yeah. to meet john calfa it was very <laughs> that was before hashing me too so um and then <laughs> the um so yeah so chris obviously had a little session with don calfa behind the scenes and then um 
basically we did our next one was on uh, screening was on that Hellraiser and Hellraiser 2 and Matt had the, some of the cast there I'd done a documentary before as I said uh, I was work for hire regards to a writer and I thought you know no one's ever done a documentary on Hellraiser before the big doc on on not on Elm Street on Friday the 13th why is no one done on Hellraiser they're both the first two films are uh, basically British films filmed over here mm. We have a lot of UK cast and crew, uh, obviously American funded. Uh, yeah. And we kind of said, that, well, let's do that. So I kind of wrote Chris in to do that. I mean, Chris is only on board really as an assistant, an interviewer at first. Um, again, without going into too much politics, the director that we had wasn't exactly good. So Chris kind of muscled his way, muscled his way in and took over that gig. Uh, and, uh, and then that was released. It came quite successful, to be honest, actually. It was, you know, it was our first one, lots of issues, you know, mm ourselves professionally in terms of obviously uh, learning curves then we got onto Brewster and then Eastwood came on board uh, and when we did Brewster I think it came more professional really because we'd learned a lot of issues on the first film a lot of things about pacing and about <clears throat> repetitive questions and that kind of stuff and, bit, and the look of it really and I think because Brewster was a lot more fun in terms of being Fright Night whereas mm. Harry's very dark when Eastwood came on board, obviously Eastwood put, he edited it and obviously put a lot of pace into it. And obviously Chris was working on him as well. Did the motion graphics for us, did an amazing job. And he, that started with getting really good kind of traction reading, got you know, really good reviews. And then just snowballed I and mean, we've gone on about obviously the other projects. But we started off as fans, you know, we were all fans of, of, of the franchises and cult classic films. We all came together that way. Obviously me and Chris and Adam met that way. Uh, I mean, I've known Adam about 25 years, 24 years. And then obviously Eastwood joined us about how many years ago? Eastwood eight nine years ago maybe. Yeah, nine years ago I think. Yeah, yeah. Right now, yeah. Yeah. I, so, I scoped yeah. these guys out on Twitter and saw yeah. an amazing your call, <laughs> your so called Brewster poster, which uh, Stephen Humphreys had made of. Uh, yeah, the characters from Fright Night, and I was like, they're doing a documentary on Fright Night because I'd love that movie. Reached out to Gary. And then met Gary and Chris at Chris's house and just said, like, I'm happy to do whatever. And then, yeah, I was editing that with those guys. And it's just snowballed from there, hasn't it, really? You can't, can't get rid of me now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah uh, funny thing about Fright Night. I found out last year that it's my favorite movie ever made. Not really. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, we did a we had an episode that came out on my birthday. And I'm like, oh, you know, I'll pick a movie that I love. And uh, my guest decided that the movie I picked was not right. So they decided we were going to review Fright Night and they informed me it was my favorite movie. Uh, so now it's my favorite movie, even though I didn't pick it. Be, according to them, they they hijacked no, my birthday really. episode. I do love Fright Night, though. That is a really good yeah, movie. Yeah, well, we do. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You guys like Fright yeah. Night also? Yeah, and, and the second one as well we like as well, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> um, actually, one question I want to ask, because I actually love there's like this boom now of like film documentaries and as someone who loved like the dvd era that had mm. like the making ofs on dvd like uh, i love um charles d lazarica's stuff for the alien series he made these yeah. like really good documentaries uh and what i've noticed is like you know physical media isn't as big as it used to be and like the movies that i like the bigger studio movies like the making ofs you give see they seem like really watered down. Like they're only showing you like the positive sides and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Like I miss seeing like documentaries where they talk about like everything that went wrong, like the fights that they had on set and stuff. And you're kind of losing that. So that's why I like this new modern trend of the, these big film documentaries about like either franchises or in one film in particular, or even like actors like Robert Englund. Um, and uh, I guess the next question is how do you choose which film you want to cover obviously it's a movie you guys like but what makes you think like i need to know more like more people need to know about this i think it's like going well gary it, hellraiser was gary's choice so he kind of got me on board with that and fright night was as well actually mm -hmm. you know uh, i was definitely a fan of fright night when it came to doing that i was ready for it hellraiser i'll admit i don't mind i appreciate mm -hmm. it but i really had to get in the zone with hellraiser so going on what you said with dvd yeah. Uh, as soon as Gary said, you know, do you want to come and do this? I was like, cool, yeah. No, I love Hellraiser. Straight to a second-hand <laughs> shop to go and get the box set and then <laughs> and watch what features have been on there. But overall, in a nutshell, we try our best to avoid doing anything that's already had its day. So as you said, mm -hmm. like Charles Lozarica's stuff, the Blade Runner doc, the Aliens doc, in my yeah. opinion, there's no need 
to go near that again because you've pretty much got apart from the odd you know missing uh character they're covered um yeah so it's it's kind of the case of looking for where there's like almost i guess you could say gaps in the market i think leviathan hellraiser was basically well freddie's had his day you know with uh oh. never sleep again jason had uh crystal lake memories and his name was jason mm-hmm. so that was where hellraiser came from and then for things like fright night that hadn't really had up-to-date retrospective so that made sense and then same for i suppose like with robocop really you know yes there has been an abundance Mm -hmm. of 10th anniversary edition 15th anniversary 20 and they always add little things but i mean i'm glad now in retrospect you know yeah it's a bit audacious to say yeah four hours on one film but Mm -hmm. having looked at what we actually extracted out of all that and the amount of stories that i think it was eastwood said Mm -hmm. on another interview a while ago it's surprising just how much it's like kind of on par, maybe not on par, but dramatic, but with the likes of Jaws and Apocalypse Now, that it was absolute chaos behind the scenes. Yeah. You're going on what you said before as well. Yeah. One of our mandates is to not sugarcoat shit. If this <laughs> talks about, we're going to do it. We just don't want to be exploitative, if that makes sense, you know, but yeah. I'm not, I'm not going to try and, you know, relay some facts and go, oh, wasn't that brilliant? And you know, deep down, I was like, no, it wasn't. Yeah. I will say, uh, Robo Doc, when they talked about how Peter Weller was just fucking everyone, <laughs> I'm like, man, you would not see that on a de- like. I don't think, I don't think if I buy like the Force Awakens Blu-ray, there's not a, a commentary where like Adam Driver is just crushing puss every other day. I'm like, oh wow, that's actually pretty interesting. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, uh, so some documentaries that I like, uh, well, one, uh, The Electric Boogaloo, The Wild Untold Story of Canada yeah. Films. Yeah. That's a good one. Uh, I feel like that's required viewing from people. <laughs> uh, and I used to love uh, the original document of the dead from 1980. The one that yeah. was like made while they were, that was in the ultimate edition uh, Dawn of the Dead DVD set. I used to love that. I recently Scream Queen. I got real into the Scream Queen documentary. I thought that was really cool. Uh, but yeah, like those older documentaries, it was cool to see people like shouting at each other and screaming and talking about everything they hated. It's just, you know, yeah, like, yeah. like, I think a lot of credit's got to go to like to genuinely yeah. like Tommy Hudson and Mikey Perez. I think when they did mm. Never Sleep Again, I know they did yeah. the stream documentary before that. But I think they kind of really kind of changed the ball game, really. I think, in terms of independent mm. projects. As you said, you know, there was lots of documentaries back in the day and then it kind of filtered yeah. out into these really kind of puff pieces in terms of DVDs, which were great. I mean, I, and, I know Chris yeah. and he's sort of the same. I love bonus features and I used to buy a Blu-ray just for the bonus features. And mm. I used to love listening to commentaries as well. But in terms of, obviously, you know, the studios doing anything, it just wasn't happening. You know, there was no investment. And then mm. Tommy Hudson comes along with Mikey and, and starts doing Never Sleep Again, Chris Lake Memories. That's what pushed us in terms of the Leviathan. Mm-hmm. In a really weird way, because we tried to compete with them going, they've got seven hours, we're going to have nine hours on Hellraiser, which was the most stupidest mistake Chris ever made. <laughs> I don't bad. know, I probably, I have to watch it. I, I could no, watch you the don't, Hellraiser. No. <laughs> yeah, you don't I, 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 watch, the, <laughs> watch the Arrow Cut, which is only three hours long. On the oh, okay. Films, but have you guys, you guys did something for Hellraiser 3 also, we, right? Little, yeah, it's only a, a half hour, 40 minute kind of feature, because we had a few oh, okay. cast members who were recurring, didn't we, I think. We've got we've got a bad habit of saying we're going to do one thing and then it ends up being ten things. Robocop was only supposed to be like a not well you know a good solid ninety minute to two two and a half hour retrospective, yeah. which turned into four and a half. With that, we picked up pretty much virtually all well, you know a good chunk of the cast and crew from two and three. So we've still got those to come. But that was a similar thing with Leviathan, I think, because I remember the one <laughs> the one day we had um, what's his face Ken Carpenter Ken who plays uh, Camera Head. Yeah, yeah. Like three just came and shot his interview in our motel room in a stinky <laughs> little motel room in wherever it was the Boulevard. So it's like, okay, I guess we're doing Hellraiser three as well. But it ended up yeah. like kind of shortchanged it a bit in that respect. Yeah. Don't you? about half an hour well look let me know if you ever do hellraiser bloodline i had to research the hell out of that movie for my patreon series i do where me and my cousin my cousin is deathly afraid of hellraiser so i decided to make a patreon series where i just force her to watch every hellraiser movie uh (laughs) that's actually finishing soon but we actually love four even though the movie's a mess so i went back and i i hunted down the work print i watched Mm -hmm. the fan restoration there's a new blu-ray that says it has a cleaned up work print but i don't know if it's the one that's been publicly available or they a have, new one, they've not really said how they have been some speculation. That's true. Is that through Arrow? Yeah, I think it's through Arrow because they're putting no, the don't talk about them. Huh? 
No, oh, never mind then. No, never, <laughs> never mind, mind then. then. No. Yeah, uh, but yeah, I think, I think yeah, there's been some speculation if that's going to be the actual work print and obviously remastered. I mean, hopefully it is. I hope it is. Yeah. They, man they managed to find the surgeon scene, which we couldn't. So the surgeon scene in uh, number two. Uh, yeah, yeah, that was like yeah. a recent one. Yeah, yeah, we knew about it, but no one and they found it. So fair play to them on that, you know. Um, yeah, because the work print that exists it, for four is when Joe Chappelle came on and replaced the original director. So it's not even like the director's original vision. So that's mm -hmm. why I'm interested to see what this new yeah. work print is, if it is that or not. Um, so yeah, uh, when it comes to these films. I need to know how much of a bitch is it to license all of that footage and the images and whatnot. <laughs> uh, so obviously we, we have to use a fair use lawyer. So that takes yeah. a lot of time in terms of being, you know, the first two were quite creative in terms of independent. Mm. Uh, we may have obviously had some gray areas there, but thankfully they were then licensed subsequently by the studios for their own bonus features. So that we got away with it on that time. Yeah. Uh, but in terms of going moving forward with Pennywise, obviously Hollywood Dreams and, and um, uh, RoboDoc, it's, it's a lot through obviously legal reasons. So we have an amazing fair use lawyer who's worked on everything you can think of from mm. In Search of Darkness to Never Sleep Again. Yeah. Uh, it's it, the, the lads themselves here. I mean, and Chris obviously had a lot of very kind of torturous process through Pennywise <laughs> with regards to fair use, and, and, and Eastwood did actually as well. But I think Eastwood himself did lots of, I tell you himself in a second, I imagine, lots of research on fair use and, and obviously um, the best way of getting around kind of like, you know, using footage. But yeah, so it's a very long, tedious process we have to go through with legals uh, yeah. archive uh, release forms and obviously insurances as well um not a nice part of making a documentary <laughs> <laughs> yeah i i because i i did some like documentary stuff in like college and i've worked in some tv stuff and that was like they're like oh shit there's a picture in the background we got to get rid of that we, we yeah. got to figure out who owns that <laughs> oh god blur it blur it. <laughs> yeah i mean um, you, you did lots of work didn't you on it on terms of prior research and again yeah. that's like great but in terms of trying to figure out what we could actually get away with before we had the <laughs> lawyer involved yeah just educating myself on fair use it's it's different it's very still like gray areas there's no like right or wrong or you have to do it this way or this is the duration that you have to use for a clip if you want to use it under interviewee in the uk and america are slightly different so i was just educating myself because i was so, sort of concerned that all this work's gone into it. Now we've sold the, the documentary and we're having to go through the legal process. Mm. How do I get through this without it being a completely different documentary in the end of it? So it was, yeah, educating myself as I went. Chris and Gary had worked on, were working on two other documentaries while I were editing uh, RoboDoc. And then, yeah, I mean, I, I was... I was trying to be clever whilst I was doing it and thinking, okay, how can we, we need to, we need to make creative choices here, but we need to be clever with the context. You've got a running commentary on the things that's explaining sort of, um, uh, it's usually the cast or the crew that's under it themselves. So we were really fortunate in having 65 interviewees when you've got the person that's talking about their own scene, naturally, they're going to, they're going to, they're going to give some, some great trivia. It wasn't <laughs> like we needed to get a super fan to narrate what was going on. And then that's where it gets a bit tricky. I think with legal, because, um the context can get a little bit skewed there so just be careful but i was so sort of relieved once we got the notes for the four hours because it was a, you know it's a lot of effort and a lot of time yeah. it, took, it took like two and a bit months to go through the whole legal process and it was at the very end as well after we'd done everything so you get so excited about the end result and then it's like over to legal out of your hands and then you're just waiting to hear back and it's like okay and it's you get that nervy feeling in the in the stomach and then i remember when we got the notes through and we were, we were all texting each other and it was just like a bit of a relief of being like right we've done a good job of this so on to the next episode we had to do it for obviously four four episodes <laughs> nearly five hours so it was i will yeah, say two, um <laughs> two months of that yeah i will say a credit to your editing i it, it those documentaries like the the robo doc it feels like a breeze like it doesn't feel its length at all i love that like all the visuals you put into the interviews like if someone pretends they're shooting a gun like you have a muzzle flash on their fingers uh, when they're describing like scenes, you see like police lights behind them. It keeps it very, very like because uh, most documentaries are like talking heads, which is standard. Uh, but I like the little visual uh, like gags and stuff that you guys threw into that because it made it just more, feel more fast paced, even though it is a very long series, which I'm fine with, by the way. I, I think I saw Robocop when I was three or four. So I've been talking about it for 30 years. So four hours is fine. I can listen to people talk about Robocop for four hours because I've been talking about it for a long, long time. 
My my um, favorite animation that Eastwood did is when Calvin Young does the cocaine in his face. Yeah. <laughs> it's like fucking Al Eastwood, you're going too far now. <laughs> <laughs> I guess the giggle kind of from like one person, I'm going to do yeah. it. I love I love when they were. Uh, that was it. Talking. And it was like, yeah, you you just live for those reactions. And you again, I'm willing to put the effort in. And another thing is, Chris and I, we wanted to do it with green screen. It was Robocop. We wanted to have those backgrounds feel integrated with the film and it all feel mm. like a cohesive piece. So I've seen documentaries where it's clearly green screen, but then they just put a gray background in it. And it's like, why did you bother doing the green screen? Yeah. So it was like, how can we set it in, in Delta City slash, you know, or Detroit? How can we have some fun with those backdrops and interact with some things that are going off on screen? So we've got mm. the, you know, the pictures talking about the quotes while the scenes are going on behind like all that sort of stuff's really fun to do it yeah. takes ages but like i think it's worth it in the end because again if, if one or two people get a giggle out of it then that, that that's worth it to me yeah. and chris was when when the guys came around to my house to watch it and some of the reactions i was like there we go that was, that was worth, <laughs> that, it was worth all the work yeah my, my favorite was the guy talking about how they wanted more blood in this death scene. You added like the CGI blood coming out when he's like, yeah. So they went like this and all the blood squirts come out of him. Um, I wanted to say, uh, I love what you guys do with the, the 2d animation to like act out like certain scenes. I thought that was incredible. Um, and that is really, cause like, I like that you guys actually, you had access to like the deleted scene that for whatever reason didn't get filmed and you figured out a really cool way to show it. Um, yeah, I just, I just, where did that idea come from where you just wanted to do like a 2d animation instead of just having them talk about it? Again, I think like, again, me, and, I'm going to just keep saying me and Chris, but like Chris yeah. and I are super, super fans. Anything that's Robocop we've seen, anything yeah. before it started we'd seen. So it's like, if we're going to do something in a documentary, we want it to feel fresh. So if we're going to do a retelling of a scene, yeah, we've got some of the storyboards boards for those scenes and we could have just had the storyboards, but it's a four and a half hour long documentary and those storyboards are throughout. So it's like, how can we do something a bit different? Let's get an incredible artist. So we found somebody on Instagram called Martin Go, who was absolutely phenomenal. And he put in so much effort and detail. You look at the ridges and you look at the detail that's in just, just like the costumes and the beard and all the, all the mm. character details. It's unbelievable. And then you talk about the backgrounds that he did. Um, he did a lot of our interviewee backgrounds too. It was unbelievable, but it was like, how can we, how can we, sh how can we show scenes that people might be familiar with, but in a different way and give you those deleted parts or those alternative scenes that were never, were never shot. So that was, that was, that was the reason for it really. It was just to spice it up. Listen, we've all watched documentaries where you, 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 you want to get through it, but you're sort of switching off halfway. I think whenever you add a new element, whether it's animation or sound design or green screen elements, compositing, whatever, you, you're sort of changing those gears and you're, sh you're shifting it and changing the pace a little bit. That's going to either shake people up or just keep them engaged. Yeah. So, it's yeah, just another layer. And no, I, I you did not go and watch Leviathan, the story of Alvarez. <laughs> <laughs> that really is that initial cut that was made. It's <laughs> just, I mean, it almost Eastwood looks like he is actually one of the interviewees because all we had was blue wall, <laughs> red wall, blue wall, white wall, red wall, blue wall. So, well, yeah, like the, the kind of where documentaries are going, the approach and the effort, and what might seem like a bit like, let's say, trivial but entertaining, like blood spurts. You've got to kind of enjoy, especially if you're going to go for the long run, you know, for this like four hours, you can't just be subjected to blah, 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 blah. You know, it does mm. require, like uh, Eastman puts it, the shifting gears. Well, I mean, you should just do a George Lucas. Just go back and add chains whenever anyone's talking. What like when everyone talks, that's just that's have chains come out of their mouth. Have have <laughs> like, have like uh, I don't know if you ever liked went on old geo cities pages for hellraiser fan sites just get like that yeah. animated gif of the box spinning just throw that randomly every <laughs> listen don't tempt us it's the 40th anniversary <laughs> of the and we're already talking about it so don't tempt us <laughs> look you know what i'll do it for you guys i'll add all that stuff it'll look really good i promise it won't look like shit <laughs> I think East was already said no to me about ten times. I've been, to, <laughs> I've been dropping hints in every podcast, and he just gives me filthy looks. It'll be the forty-fifth yeah. then, the minute. Yeah. Be the I would, I would. <laughs> this is when, this is when Eastwood and I freeze when Gary starts talking about okay, it. It's okay. like, look, 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 I'll edit it for you. I, it'll yeah, look like shit. <laughs> really bad, really bad <laughs> chains. Can't, can't look any worse than he did. <laughs> so we're okay. I'll, I'll get chains from like, uh, what you call it? From Getty Images, I won't get rid of the Getty <laughs> watermark. I'm going to leave that in there. <laughs> That's my new favorite thing when they put the Getty wa watermark. And like, it's actually funnier to have the Getty watermark, to be honest. <laughs> 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 
major movie should have the Getty watermark over everything. <laughs> oh, every oh. soundtrack should just have like Pond Five, Pond yeah. Five, Pond Five, Pond Pond five. Pond. Audio Jungle. Read <laughs> <laughs> <I bet> that. <laughs> um yeah so i you were talking about like storyboards and stuff uh how do you go about getting like i because i'm watching this document i've seen like my, behind the scenes robocop stuff but you guys got so much material for this documentary who like gave that to you that was john davison the original the guy who it, it wouldn't have happened without he was the one that had that owned half of the film and dished it mm. out to 15 people i think in the cast and crew are still making money off it now even despite orion when they originally went bankrupt the guys were still yeah. making money for decades um he was like oh you should get in touch with he donated it to a library and just said you should get in touch with the library and i'll give you a pass to basically scan and, and archive and take whatever you want and it was hundreds and hundreds if not a few thousand pages um and then there were other things too other materials sound effects the um dailies um we got off cuts and things that uh from some of the assistant editors or an assistant editor on south um yeah it was i mean once once i got that delivered and thankfully gary was happy to pay for the postage because i was like we've found all this stuff gary it's 200 quid po postage <laughs> and he was like for fuck's sake he said and then when it came <laughs> when it came and i was like it's gold don't worry because we didn't this is the thing we didn't necessarily know what we had on those thousands of pages we had steve lee who's our um uh, he's an archive producer on the project and he also was present for the production of Robocop. He was a sound um, archivist and librarian. He worked on <laughs> Robocop as well with the two Academy Award winning uh, sound designers. He was, uh, I say happy, he was willing to uh, go to the library on our behalf and basically scan everything and spend like two days getting everything in John Davison's house slash production office. He was an absolute diamond. So if it, if it wasn't for Steve, it was still it would still be over there and we wouldn't we wouldn't have that in the documentary so again we had to be patient with it and i had to be persistent and liaise with so many people even at the library they were like oh we could, you know what are the opening hours if you want to have a thousand pages scan like it was so many just uh back and forth with those and they were like who are these brits just asking for stuff um but again we we, we got there in the end and it, it's in, the stuff we've got is incredible and unfortunately we couldn't put everything in the doc so there's stuff that you know, we've got, I've got literally around the corner that no one, no one's seen. Don't, yeah, don't come around to the house. Um, but, uh, <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Paul Coven. And wait for <laughs> yeah. Robo, we need to wait for Robo Book. Don't forget, so that's soon. Oh, yeah. okay. And I will say, it was and we, throwing we, out yeah. all these things we're doing. <laughs> yeah, there's nothing we've left out that wouldn't be like, um, it's not going to be revolutionary to yeah. have to show you that some of the better things. We've got, I mean, we've got things like people's salaries and their addresses and mm. their ages. <laughs> you know, and I say we got Peter Weller. All the cast and crew got <laughs> yeah. paid. And you'd be surprised, some of the cast, I think, got like $175 for a day's work. Oh, um, and they were obviously the the secondary cast, but it, I mean, I've got all of all of that stuff, which yeah. we wouldn't put in the doc because that that wouldn't be uh, ethical. But yeah. you know what it is. <clears throat> I will say I loved hearing the raw audio of like Peter Weller, like before the post production went in there. That was a really cool element. Uh, I thought that was awesome. Like, wow, you're just hearing raw audio of them recording these now famous lines, and it's just like, oh yeah, your move, creep. And I'm like, that's that's the most amazing thing ever recorded and they had no idea at the time it's like it was well. As well. Like, i love the fact that we've actually got i mean it's not ed 209 who says it is it but it's the sound guy you know going oh sorry john i fucked up hearing ed 209 oh the ed 209 sounding voice say that it's like yeah. holy shit so <laughs> the thing is we'd seen a lot as fans of this stuff you know we've trolled the internet i mean pretty much what 90 97, 98, when we started getting the internet dialed up in the house, you know, I was straight to like, oh, Robocop pictures. And, you know, later on, it was yeah. different. But, you know, we felt we had seen virtually everything there was out there. So when, and to be honest, there's not like a wealth with, with Pennywise. We lucked out massively there because the co director, uh, John Campo Piano, who did mm. that, uh, he got off all the parents of the cast, especially because of all the kids. They had like really overzealous parents. They're going, oh, my little baby's first film. So they were trigger happy with like yeah. family shots and their own photos. So we got an abundance of these never before seen photos for that. Whereas Robocop's a bit of a different game. Like anything in the way of photos was either like publicity stills. I mean, we only got at best a handful of like, holy shit, someone's Polaroid from the set. So then when things like the documents started coming in and with like, especially the subject being like, 
what if, you know, like the alternate uh, people who were suggested to play Robocop from Steven yeah. Seagal to Craig T. Nelson was like, holy shit. <laughs> and I think we kind of really struck goals when um, Easter would refresh me on this. But like some of these dailies shots have never been seen before. We've actually had them digitized. So the gang shooting up the street uh, where he goes home. And I think the one part where he's been um, thrown to the floor by Ed 209 has never been seen before. So that's this is the first time we've felt a bit like that. Um, is yeah. it Peter and Brack who did Friday the 13th of going into the vaults and finding these things, getting them digitized? You know, yeah. you feel like fucking Indiana Jones when you're doing this. So to find this stuff was like uh, uh, incredible. But East, where do we get that from, those dailies? Those dailies are John Davison, so that was VHS that he sent over, but he didn't know what it was. He, I was just pestering. If you just speak to John Davison, I was that annoying guy. Gary knows this. I was that annoying guy who was like, <laughs> are you sure there's nothing else? Are you sure? Because once this is out, we hope we don't want you to find something. So I was pestering him, so he sent us he sent us all sorts, and he would just pepper it throughout the years, just say, oh, by the way, I've just found this in my garage. And the VHS was 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 one of it. He sent he sent us some tapes. He sent us some audio tapes as well from the from the press junket of, uh, that Orion put together, which had, uh, to my knowledge, I'd never heard before. It wasn't online anywhere, which is in you know we've got Peter Weller interviews in the doc um, that's from that. But yeah, he he sent the v, was the VHS, and then I had it digitized at ITV here in the state in the, in the states here in the UK. <laughs> but I when I went down to, to have it digitized, I we had the monitors off because I was like I don't want to see it in front of everybody. I can't be excitable in front of a load of other professionals. <laughs> let's, digitize, let's digitize it with the monitor off, have it obviously in the in the correct frame rate and all that. And then I got home and that's when I loaded it up here and called Chris afterwards to tell him what he was. But yeah, it was I didn't want to sort of like waste that moment in front of a load of people that would be like, what's this guy kicking off about? Because they wouldn't know what it's from. So yeah. um I yeah I tried to savor that but that was amazing. But it could have been John Davison didn't know what was on it. He'd not watched it. He hadn't um uh, had a V8 uh, the VCR player so he didn't know he just sent it over and then just stipulated that I needed to send anything back to him that we that he sent over which obviously we would do and we did yeah. um but I'm still I'm, I still reckon he's going to call us one day and go I've just found another 10 10 tapes in my attic or something it will probably happen I found out I found the whole deleted Ed 210 subplot. It's there. I'm like, oh no. <laughs> yeah, Where was it? Ed 210? What? <laughs> yeah, yeah. The movie was originally 10 hours long. <laughs> yeah. Oh, don't do that, please. Oh, I found the footage yeah. of Robocop's kid sidekick, Robbie. <laughs> Robbie Cop, we called him. Like, what? That's not in the movie. <laughs> Robo Dog. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, the Robo Dog. We have the makeup text of Rob White. Oh my god! <laughs> the kid actually, R Murphy's kid in it, who's the one who says, "Can you do that, Dad?" And he's watching the TV. We yeah. found him on Facebook. I reached out to him, so he he actually provided a picture, a photograph oh, cool. that's in the documentary. He couldn't again because we couldn't get him a, a green screen out, mm. and he was like, "To be honest, it was I was like ten. I wouldn't have any memories of it uh, now." But um. Mm. <laughs> we we tried everybody, Tony. Like honestly, Gary will tell you. We we went. Uh, we we've seen people say oh, it's a shame you couldn't get Rob Bottin, and we agree. But we tried. We tried Rob Bottin. We tried Hophead, the guy in the grocery store, and he he demanded a substantial fee that we couldn't afford at the time. Wow. Um, same with um, Will Shockley, uh, Bill Shockley, who's uh, who I, who's actually in Showgirls. He's the one that rapes the. Yes, rapes, uh, <laughs> Naomi is it or no what's she called is it Naomi in Showgirls yeah you know, I haven't seen Showgirls in a bit my friend Adam from Adam Does Movies just uh, reviewed it I need to go back and watch that that was fundamental to my childhood I really wanted to <laughs> that. <laughs> that that changed my life man that makes it interesting <laughs> But yeah, if they're, if they're not in there, it's not it's not because um, yeah. Gary and Mikey didn't try. We I I will people. say, I love the the Pennywise documentary, like all the behind the scenes stuff you guys got from that, like the pictures, because like that's I've seen like a few pictures of like the makeup tech uh, tests of Tim Curry, but like that's a movie I've never seen any real behind the scenes stuff for. Uh, yeah. My favorite was them building the spider puppet and putting the clown wig on it. Yeah. And I'm like, that actually kind of wouldn't have been that bad. <laughs> the, the clown was... so that's where the remake got it from. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I will say it was very, it's very satisfying when there's like a part of a movie you hate and then you hear the filmmakers agree with you and you're like, oh, thank you so much. We, I'm yeah, not wrong. That and that one... whole spider segment is amazing. <laughs> and that was one of those instances actually where uh, there was a bit of like discussion behind the scenes when we were getting around to doing that on the interviews so all that behind the scenes footage again had never been seen we, we'd lucked out because actually if you've yeah with hollywood dreams pennywise robodoc and even the fright night 2 doc 
the common denominator there is a guy called Bart Mixon, one of the effects guys. So to be honest, that's another thing when choosing our docs. Shit, man, Bard's got a wealth of this. <laughs> when we did Fright Night 2, you know, it was like, oh, okay, we're going to do this guy, Bart Mixon, let's see what he's done. And you're like, holy fuck, Nightmare on Elm Street 2, Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2, yeah. Robocop. Like, oh my God, they're my favorite films. So yeah. of course, jumping at the bit to chat to him. But the great thing about that, he's now gone on, he's like working on all the Marvel shows and films mm. and everything. Proper fanboy himself, but... He yeah. keeps like you know archives of some of the photos from this doc. Actually, that's some of the nicest photos we got of like um, the makeup under mm. the helmet of Robocop. But Pennywise was like his baby, you know. Yeah. So he was like, "Oh, I've got I don't know what was it a couple hours worth of behind the scenes videotapes never before shown. I got all these photos and everything like that." So that's kind of where that just dated. But when it came to the spider. I remember when we were getting around to doing that part of the interview and mm. there was just this talk on the set of like, oh, oh well, maybe we shouldn't say much about, you know, the spider being bad. I'm like, we have got to fucking talk about No, you've got to talk about the spider we being bad. Are you trying to do something. You can't sugarcoat that. And so, in yeah. a way, hopefully what we come up with, and again, I'm stealing this from Eastwood, but it's what you call the shit sandwich approach of, you know, oh, it's, you know, this is why it's good, but this is why it's really bad. But actually, this is why it was good, or this is why it went wrong. So, if yeah. anything, if you look at that first you can actually see how impressive that animatronic was, you mm. know, with the mandibles and everything like that. That it is almost that it just didn't get shot properly, or at least the lighting in post. It could have been, enough. it could have been filmed a little bit better. Uh, also, it probably would have been cooler in a different movie. Uh, <laughs> that's the thing. I'm like, you're you're right. Uh, it uh, chapter two. I wasn't super into that movie, but at least when it came to the spider, I'm like, okay, they knew they. They went half spider. That was smart. That was yeah, smart yeah. of them. I wish the movie was a little bit better, but I'm like, I, they do. They're like, let's not totally ignore the spider, but let's try to make it. So Pennywise is still involved with it. You just never got that damn space turtle. Oh, yeah. Wow. What they go oh, yeah. for it. Come on. Why didn't they do the space turtle? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> they also didn't reveal that Pennywise was laying eggs. Cause I'm pretty sure that's the threat in the book is that he like laid eggs. So there's going to be more. And it's just like, well, if you don't have that subplot, then the the real issue is just just leave the goddamn town. <laughs> like he doesn't, he can't leave this town. Just get out, and he'll starve to death. Uh, anyway, anyway, not to criticize, you know, Stephen King. Uh, <laughs> and then those yeah. movies. <laughs> um, uh, let's see here. Uh, oh yeah, here's a very important question. So I asked my Discord and my friend Tab. He asked a very, very important question here. Uh, what kind of fabric softener do you use? He thought that was a very important thing to ask. Any question you could have asked. I'm like, hey guys, I have these like filmmakers on. Ask some like really <laughs> cool questions that are interesting. He's like, oh, what kind of fabric softener do they use? And so the I don't know if you want. I think I use Lenore. Yeah, I've got okay. like close tulip Lenore because I've, I've, I've got an eleven week old here, so I've I've been responsible for doing all the house. Uh, stuff. So gotcha, I'm well versed in the washing machine, and I just got a tumble dryer recently as well. If we want to go further down this route, and it, it was a revelation. So, it's um, nice. It's nice. Uh, I'm there, do it. Do it for the same reason of Chris. I've got an eighteen month old, and I can't be asked changing the the fabric fabric softener or conditioner. I was trying to think when you asked the question, what's the what is the the fabric softener in Home Alone? I was going to go with that one. I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> it's not Daz, it's orange though, isn't it? I was going to go with that one. Just yeah. trying to be uh, just keep it. Can't remember it. Uh, Gary, do you have an answer? Hey, I I pay someone to do my washing for me, so I wouldn't know. Okay, okay. Well, oh, thank really? you. that's where the money went. <laughs> well, I want to thank Tab for wasting everyone's time with that question. I hope he it feels ashamed for asking it. And he'll never do anything like that again. Um, here's a question I had about RoboDoc. Uh, what made you decide to do it as a series instead of just doing a very long documentary like the In Search of Darkness documentaries? Mm. What made you, what made you decide to like break it up? It's more palatable to uh, distributors, to be honest. I basically okay. put it together as a four and a half hour or four hour documentary. And then we had, or Gary had a bit of pushback from when we were trying to sell it as like, oh, it's too long. Nobody wants a four hour doc on one film. And so I think I'd suggest that, well, well, we could just split it up, do it as like a series. Series are big at the minute. Let's do a series. And then Gary um, had those conversations. And then thankfully for me, they came back after 
a lot of uh, back and forth, too much back and forth. But Gary was fighting our corner basically, um, and said, "Yeah, we're going to do the four four part series." And I went, "Amazing!" So I'm going to take this four hour doc, and I'm going to sneak out a four and a half hour documentary. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think you, you asked me on obviously about what's a lot like in screen box. I think we were really lucky with screen box because we did have some kind of like um, pushback, as he was said, on the length of the documentary from our kind of like a sales kind of team. And uh, it was, took a lot of convincing to convince them first off to make it more than a 100 meter documentary, let alone a four hour. But then I got them to, I got them to 80 degree for four hours. And that was it. There was no more than four hours. And then when each would deliver the episodes, there were four hours, 10, oh, sorry, one hour, 10, one hour, 20, one hour, eight. So we managed to get away with it. But I think the screen box was so kind of like, you know, um, on board with us. Uh, and obviously streaming, the world's completely changed as well regards to streaming. You can have that. I mean, even like Breaking Bad back in the day, on Netflix, mm. you know, you'd have an hour episode, 55 minute episode, Ahsoka, Star Wars, the same thing now, isn't it? So it, it kind of gives more flexibility, really. But at the same time, it still has to kind of tighten things up still because I think Eastwood will probably admit it could have done a nine hour version of this documentary quite easily uh, with the amount of footage we had. I mean, how much footage did we have in total? We said you had interview footage. For we one. had 77 hours. Jesus. Uh, yeah, and we, we interviewed 60, 66 people. <laughs> And that's just from the first movie. So obviously we've got plans for the sequels too. And we interviewed 106 people in total. There's yeah. 40 people that are that will be in the sequel documentaries. Oof. <laughs> I, I'm excited that there's a sequel documentary. because uh, I do like I do like Robocop too. Robocop 2 is fun. I think, um, I, think I think the same thing you said, sorry, what you said earlier on about even like that scene with the spider. Yeah. The thing, I think what we found with Robocop 2 and 3, especially the third one. It's not so much perception of the film's being bad. It's about what could have been. And the kind of heart and soul went into making those films in the first place. So I, know, mm-hmm. I remember when we were doing Choose to the Third film, and people genuinely wanted to do a good job in that movie. And actually, sometimes that's the more interesting stories for me as a filmmaker and a documentarian, is what could have been. Actually, people, no one goes out to make a bad film, and you, no one does that. Even you know, if you're doing an independent short film or independent feature film, nobody goes, I'm going to do a shitty film. No one does that. But there's always reasons why. Sometimes films don't come out the best way. Yeah. Yeah. Whole part of these documentaries is explore that and, and, and just basically justify a little bit sometimes after years of you know looking back. And I think hopefully people will watch the sequel ones and go, you know what, they're not as bad as people remember. And what we can show and some of the behind the scenes stuff we can show as well and stories, maybe people appreciate it a little bit more, hopefully. That's the, that's yeah. the kind of plan. Actually, I, I actually really like two. I don't rewatch it as much as the first one, obviously. Uh, but two is two is very fun. Three is weak, but at the same time, I would love to watch a video on like how it ended up that way because I know it sat on yeah. a shelf for like a few years. Um, I know yeah, like in the better documentaries as well. I think I, Chris, you said this uh, last week about Troll Two, fantastic documentary. The, yeah. the Troll Two documentary and the film. The director thinks that's the best film ever made, and, and he's the only one on the planet. I think. But um, <laughs> and then there's Lost Souls, the other one, which turned out to be a mess. But the documentary on that's amazing. Yeah, um, yeah. That's yeah. the Winona Ryder movie, right? No, that's Lost the uh, Island. I learned about the Maroon. Oh, Island. oh yeah, no, 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 you're right. Sorry, Lost Souls. I think is a Winona Ryder movie, but the documentary about Island. Sorry, I forgot about that. <laughs> with, with, with Lost Souls, what one, one thing proves that documentary as well is, I mean, if you watch Lost Souls, it's or Chris has gone. Uh, uh, Chris died. Yeah, uh, it, 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 hopefully, it, he comes back. <laughs> yeah, if you watch Lost Souls, a documentary, I think it, it doesn't look that great aesthetically. You know, I think some of the interviews are shot quite low res and shot over okay. years. But it doesn't matter because the stories are so interesting and mm-hmm. the people are so engaging. You completely look past that. And I think as documentaries ourselves, you know, we, we try and make things look really nice, you know, and Eastwood's a genius yeah. about, about bigging up too much. But sometimes it, the important thing is the stories as well. And I think when you've got those two things combined then, where you've got amazing visuals and it's been shot really nice, but then you've got great stories, you are, you're on to a winner then because it's about, obviously, you know, as I said, you know, every single film uh, set, People want to be there, obviously, to make something special, don't they? And I think we try and explore that as much as we can. Mm. Yeah. And people are going to get that with Robocop 3 as well. Fred Decker, uh, Robert Burke was so candid and honest, and there was no like beating around the bush with it. What they thought they would get that film, the end result was going to be He's changed back. during the production. In so. a completely different, sorry, yeah. your, your background <laughs> completely changed. <laughs> He's on the toilet now, by the looks of it. <laughs> yeah. I've never had this happen mid-interview before, especially on a live one. I was like, oh, it's fine. It's probably just Gary's signal. I was watching him crumble away. 
then I looked at my um, router into my bedroom, flashing red. So you, I might start looking a bit red myself now, having like brown streaks. <laughs> but anyway, as you were. Okay. Um, <laughs> Does we talking about you, Chris? <laughs> Uh, I do want to circle back to Fred Decker at some point, but um, yeah. Uh, are there any films that like you wanted to cover and do documentaries on for whatever reason? Couldn't. Yeah. Not renowned straight hundred percent, but it was done. Well, obviously, yeah. yeah, that's yeah. The problem. I think we, we, we came into this 10 years ago. So uh, we did want to do one on child's play as well. We did. We, we got really close obviously, to Tom Holland and Tom Holland mm. had loads of behind the scenes footage on that. He had tapes and tapes of it. And we did have a meeting, remember, Chris, with, with Tom and his son about it. But yeah. again, I think at the time, we wanted to be a bit more kind of like, um, have more creative control over the project. And I think Tom wants to tell a particular story. And I know there's all that kind of like, you know, to do about Don Mancini, Don Mancini and him. We didn't want to get involved with him that really, because, you know, we're not, we're not there to like, and thankfully now, they've obviously, that's all kind of been, you know, kind of like phased out. And, and they obviously both appreciate each of us role in that movie. But, that's why we did Nightmare on Elm Street, the Hollywood Dreams Nightmares, really, because we wanted yeah. to obviously work with Robert and do something about, <laughs> obviously, his career. But we've been, I think, fortunate with Fright Night in terms of that everybody loves Fright Night, yet mm -hmm. nobody's ever really celebrated the movie, and especially the second film, nobody's ever celebrated that. I would look, I mean, I'm, I'll let these lads speak in a second. I would have loved to have done Lost Boys, but again, it was an amazing documentary, which is 90 minutes long. Yeah. And, you know, and Corey Hames in there, and, and you know, and the guy who plays Max, my head's completely gone blank now. You know, uh, key people are already in that. It's a great doc. So to, to do a documentary on Lost Boys now, when you've got the already a really great existing doc, which is 90 minutes long, which has all the cast and crew uh, obviously available at that time, it would be just, it would just be silly, really, unless we're doing something completely kind of like a new angle on it. So yeah. I think we've been lucky. I think strying up a little bit. I think and, and Robodoc was, was, was one where we were kind of told not to do it uh, and uh -oh. we were advised not to do it. Uh, that's why we did it, because we were told not to. <laughs> uh, and I think it was our biggest kind of beast read. And I think it's going to be really hard moving forward now in terms mm. of a retro on a movie after something as huge as Robodoc, particularly as it's three seasons and it's like, you know, yeah. it's hours and hours and hours of obviously of, of, of episodes. So it's kind of, yeah, I think we're at a stage now where we're trying to look at something different, I think, in terms of moving forward. So yeah. there's a few films, again, I'll let these two talk now about what we'd like to do, but it's obviously... It's then pieces coming together. So, so for Rova Doc, you're doing two and three. I'm, I'm assuming you're not going to touch on the made for TV movies or the live action show or the remake. Wow. Yeah, uh, we actually did Chris. get a lot of the Canadian series, actually. So, oh. well, because for years we, uh, well, for, yeah, because we didn't get Peter Weller till about five years into this project. Yeah. Um, because there was this kind of sense that he wasn't game to talk about Robocop. He had no interest in being involved in the documentary initially. And I think that's just kind of where that we knew we were going to touch on the sequels, but mm. I think it was <laughs> being a bit bitchy on our parts. Like, oh, well, we've got to get Peter Weller. We can get Robert Burke from Robocop 3, or we'll get Richard. <laughs> the Let's get every other Robocop, you know. <laughs> we go, well, we've got all the rest of them here. Um, and actually, yeah, so, to, I mean, as Eastwood said this before as well, but as far as it goes for me as a lifelong fan of these films, and to be honest, you know, I can obviously, I can, I can definitely give things like Robocop 3 a pass. I remember mm -hmm. that was the one I was allowed to watch. Robocop okay. 1 and 2, I had to like sneak from a mate's lunchbox in school. Uh, meanwhile, my parents showed it to me at 3. They're like, here, here's how to use the VCR. We have some <laughs> tapes here. Uh, Robin Hood... Uh, the Snow White, Predator, Robocop. <laughs> like, like I would literally, <laughs> I would literally like put Jungle Book on and sing all the songs, and then eject it. I'm like, okay, now I'm gonna put Robocop on <laughs> and watch people just get. And then it was just a normal day for me growing up. <laughs> I'm like, oh yeah, cool. And then like I found out years later, I'm like, oh, other people's parents didn't do this. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, we we I think for for us, like I you know, we were the right age for Robocop, I think. Yeah. Much so much it wasn't R rating or 18 for us. Mm. You know, the the fact that it got marketed to kids through the lunch boxes, the cartoons, the toys, and everything like that, mm. you know we were suckered into it. And then of course, I mean, I was what about six, seven years old when the series came out over here. Mm. So I loved it. It was just more Robocop. Yeah. Admittedly, the years haven't been as kind to that as it has to the first one, but I still think it's kind of quite interesting because that show was about a million dollars an episode at the time. So it was yeah, quite I, advanced for its era. 
that's on my list of things to watch. Is I remember they had like reruns on Sci Fi Channel years ago, and I remember trying to watch it and just being like, "Nah, I'm good." <laughs> uh, but it's recently, fun, last year, thing. last year I thought it'd be fun to watch the live action Conan the Barbarian show. Ooh. Which was just like it was made like in that Hercules era, yeah. and that thing was fucking hilarious to watch. So now I'm like, all right, I gotta revisit some of these TV shows based off violent movies that aren't as violent because they might be comedy gold mines. So I want to <laughs> go back to that. It's definitely got its moments, I think, the series. So yeah, that's that's kind of where we draw the line. We 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 knew yeah. from the get go. It's like I think to be honest, because we know personally ourselves, like, well, there's nice things we can say about that thing. Whereas if you yeah. go a bit beyond that, that's where it's like, oh, I'm really going to struggle to be diplomatic on my view of this yeah. and that. And it's, you're just opening up to like, you know, a never ending story, basically. Not yeah. literally never ending story, but oh, it's the remake. Oh, it's the reboot. It's the this. It's Rogue City that's coming out in a couple of weeks time in the game. So we had to draw a line somewhere and that's kind of where we call it. So 87 to 94 pretty much we're covering. Oh, so you're going to do when uh, Robocop was on an episode of WCW and helped Sting, right? <laughs> That's part of the Robocop 2 marketing. Oh, do you have Sting? Were you able to get Sting? <laughs> Let's get Sting. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually getting a t-shirt. I'm trying to get a t-shirt with that, that image. You know, Robo next to the guy with the blonde hair. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Were you the guy with the blonde hair? You mean Sting? <laughs> I never watched wrestling. I, uh, I just knew it was fake from birth, so I didn't like uh, it at all. Whoa. Uh, <laughs> whoa, you're not allowed to say that. <laughs> I've had oh, wrestlers on the show, Ethan. But Blue Meanie's going to delete my number now. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Sting used to do a surfer gimmick, and then the crow came out, and he switched to a crow gimmick, and he's still doing the crow gimmick to this day. <laughs> he's never <laughs> gone. Oh, not that long, man. <laughs> I was really hoping the the that when they remade RoboCop, Sting would reunite, but the time <laughs> with the remake RoboCop, because they both got dark black makeovers since their first interaction. Yeah. <laughs> but for whatever reason, that didn't happen. Probably because that movie's not very good. Probably would have made it a better film. (laughs) Honestly, if Sting showed up in the Robocop remake, I'm like, oh, at least Sting's there. That's something. (laughs) One thing. (laughs) Yeah, man, I I did not enjoy that film. Um, But yeah, as long as we're going to talk about uh, movies that are, uh, let me see here, next on your list, I assume that you're doing the 10-hour Roadhouse uh, documentary. Uh, uh, In the can? It's obviously the greatest film ever made. Why would you not do a documentary on it? Uh, Eastman looks very, very thrilled to do this project. <laughs> That's his normal face. Don't worry. <laughs> I love Swayze. I do love Swayze. If he was around, I'd come. To, I'd uh, think about it. But um, oh. yeah, and there, there's a remake of that coming out, isn't there? Which has gotten. Well, let's so let's good. not let's not talk about. We've already talked about the Robocop. Let's not dwell on remakes. Uh, I'm very upset that they're remaking Roadhouse. I'm not Why? very thrilled about Why? it. Why? And look, you know, I was very moved by the Robert Englund uh, documentary. And I was like, who are some other famous, important people you could do documentaries on? And guys, I'm ready. I'm ready. (laughs) I'm ready to talk about my life (laughs) and my life story. We're going to change a few things, obviously. Everyone knows uh, my one co-host, Johanna, on the show. We used to date back in 2008. We're changing that. We're going to say it was Megan Fox. So, like, keep that in mind. (laughs) Um, and obviously I said I was in the Dark Knight Rises as an uncredited extra. Uh, we're going to make up something where I was actually like uh, Batman's best friend, but it got cut out. Uh, <laughs> I'll delete this video by the time the documentary goes up. But I think you guys are just sitting on a gold mine here. <laughs> I mean, I think everyone in the chat right now is probably saying like, yes, we need this story told. We're definitely thinking about it now. I'm, I'm going to have a meeting straight after this. Yes, and I'll, I'll do it for a very reasonable price. Oh, forget I, I it, man. You're charging us for not doing it. Forget it. <laughs> whoa, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think it's a very important thing. Uh, and you That's got to be the cover, though, as well. Oh, 100%. <laughs> you just like, kind of like cut the eyes out and put like you know, <laughs> the red kind of the dog eyes from Ghostbusters. Yeah, <laughs> you got something in the making right there. Everyone needs the story of the guy who started talking about other people's movies in college, and then it didn't take off until like 10, 11 years afterwards. So, you know, there's a lot happened in that time. <laughs> They're like, oh, we have footage of him on that one episode of Drunk History he was on. And okay, that's it. That's the end. That's the end of his story. <laughs> um, 
but yeah uh i guess one last uh question are there any films that you would love to see like a long documentary on whether you would do it or just anyone would do it good question um yeah I, I, was one i would like and, and people okay. are going to probably rip it i, I love master universe the, the 87 film with langley yeah. and Linda and, and i know obviously there's contentious issues with a director uh but i and, and then now and obviously um oh no it's howard duck my other favorite one howard duck or master universe but again yeah. there's issues with ed gale as well isn't that everybody seems to be issues now so we need to get these documentaries done now before anybody else gets out yeah, before there's lawsuits. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I just, I mean, I love, yeah, I love those two films. I think there's a few films in the 80s which, you know, yeah. like, even though they're not brilliant, but you grew up with those films and you'd like to know more about and it's definitely Mass Universal, however, but, but no one's going to buy that shit. So I, I, mean, did, I did good. love the, the section they did on Masters of the Universe and Electric Boogaloo. Yeah. I love the story that apparently Stallone heard uh, Dolph Lundgren talking and he like went to yeah. the producer and it's like, you gave that guy lines? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Same. Um, Howard the Duck would be a really, really good one. Chris, yeah. you know I mean? no, no Jeffrey Jones. No <laughs> <Jeffrey>. <laughs> I think there's um I think there's like two two in terms of retrospectives in long form. One, and I just part of me feels like because we've done one of them, why not do the other? Is Terminator. Because you okay. know, you've got I've got you know the Robocop vinyls, the Terminator vinyls. I've almost got like a matching pair of everything. Robocop and Terminator from VHS to soundtracks to this and that. So part of me will think like when I look at it, all my Robocop stuff together, I'm like, oh, there's, a, there's one missing for Terminator. And it's that or probably uh, what's on Eastwood's shirt, actually, which is probably his as well. That's that would the- be a good one. We have a yeah. review of Last Action Hero and we actually reviewed all the Terminators. We did a what is the worst Terminator movie episode. <laughs> uh, look, I love Terminator. And I'm hoping you guys, if there's anyone who will agree with me, I'm hoping it's one or all three of you. I got shit on for saying this. I'm like, I actually like RoboCop more than any Terminator movie. And I love Terminator, but like if I, people are like, Terminator 2 is the best movie ever. I'm like, ah, RoboCop's better than that. What are you talking about? (laughs) I'm definitely of the, RoboCop's my favorite film, but I really struggle to not say you'll hate me for this because I have watched that Terminator thing you guys did. Yeah. It's hard to not, Terminator 2 is that film I just use to test out like a new surround sound, a new TV. It's just on it. A I always said, like, on a technical film. level, it's very, very good. I actually enjoyed the first Terminator more. Oh, um, if the first Terminator looked like the second Terminator, holy shit, that would be an amazing film. <laughs> Not that it isn't already amazing. I love it. Uh, but I don't know. For me, like, Ro- uh, Roadhouse. Yeah, Roadhouse, obviously better than all of them. Uh, but RoboCop, I'm just like, I'm more of a RoboCop guy. Uh, Eastman, do you have a movie you want to see documented besides Last Action Hero? <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Um, I would. This, this has been done it, to death in bits, but I would love like a full uh, Crystal Lake sort of series of the Rocky saga, so all the Rocky movies. Oh uh, yeah, seven-hour documentary. Because you see, yeah, I just love the fact that it went from this drama to this hyperbolic. I forget the Creed movies, but just this hyperbolic. Yeah. Like, just it, it got trendier and obviously tried to adapt to what was cool with you know MTV kicking off with Rocky three and four and mm. wrestling and all that sort of stuff. I think that would be awesome to get Stallone to sit down and talk about the evolution of Rocky and why that shifted so much. You yeah. talk about his physique, you talk about the characters, get Mr. T in there and Dolph. That would be <laughs> awesome. Um, maybe just stop after four, but yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know. oh, oh, you've definitely got to do five. And obviously the well, fact Tommy's that... Tommy's not around, is he? Tommy, I watched a cracking ESPN oh, documentary yeah. about Tommy and he, he died, but he... Um, yeah, that film I've not and he, got. Yeah, you and see, someone did a documentary. Trends. You say about trends as well, though, but come on, Rocky Five has got like... Yeah. The, the mandatory we're gonna have like a rap version of a song as well like everything was doing by the late 80s <laughs> adam's family had like the rap song yeah. cop two had a rap song at the end of it so i i will say i appreciate what like rocky five was trying to do yeah. uh it definitely failed for me uh there is a documentary on the director's life uh alvinson like, there's a documentary about him i know that mm-hmm. uh for me it's two newer movies because i know we'll never see it because they're both owned by Disney. But I would love a long documentary on the making of Solo, a Star Wars story, and how much of a mm. shit show that mm. was. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Uh, how they had to reshoot it. And of course, The Predator from 2018, how it just turned into a completely different movie. I've only been able to find like bits and pieces of like like photos of the original version. I yeah. found um 
Keegan Michael Key's original death scene, he's there's like a mutant monster on top of him, and his like eye is all ripped out, and that's like the only thing I can find. And everyone's seen the picture of all of them riding the tank with it. Yeah. But I would love one. I would love to see whatever that original cut was. But I would also love to see a documentary about <laughs> like, all right, here's where th- shit hit the fan because I love Fred Decker talking about it a few years ago. And he's like, they wanted this change. And I love it when it got to the end. He's like, I still don't know who wrote that ending because it kind of <laughs> came out of nowhere. <laughs> Poor guy de- never gets a break, does he, to be fair? Like, <laughs> yeah. That's, again, what was great about him with Robocop 3 as well. He's such yeah. a good, level-headed interviewee. So the stuff mm-hmm. we dug out of him for Robocop 3, and I know he sort of said it quite a lot, to be honest, but I think hopefully we fleshed it out a bit more. But yeah, you, you, I, got, I was so excited for him. And like, because it's Shane Black as well, isn't it? The predators at the bottom yes yeah so you think, holy shit they're back and this is that's be- why i was excited and then you just when you see how it all turned out you're like oh no oh no you poor guys you poor, poor <laughs> i got guys. i got shit on initially when i was on cinemasker because initially i thought the movie was like okay but it really is just like the first like 40 minutes are really entertaining because of how yeah, much yeah. the guys are assholes but then upon rewatching, i'm like oh yeah i was just kind of high off that beginning this movie is pretty fucking bad <laughs> but again uh, that is a behind like a behind the scenes or a documentary I would love to see because it they change the entire film in post. I think Alien uh, Five is another good one as well. Blom Camp's Alien. That's one I always yeah. sort of think about what could have that I mean, like we'd say about what we would love to do next. Mm. Uh, you know, I'm hard pressed to believe we're ever gonna go as far as we have with something, you know. I think Robodoc will be our citizen K yeah. in terms of scope. But I think actually what the challenge for me next, what we haven't really done is the go more into what could have been. And I think when you think of those concept arts that um, Blomkamp was putting out, he yeah. obviously had a story enough to kind of create these visuals. So to sort of have something where it's like, well, you don't get the film, but why not have a documentary about the film and yeah. actually talk through it using those, you know, that that art style would be, I think, yeah. absolutely incredible. The only way I want Alien 3 revisited uh, is if they finally were able to get David Fincher and William Gibson uh, because those that that documentary is amazing on the uh, discs, but William Gibson apparently didn't want to talk about his unproduced screenplay, even though it's now public. It's a comic. It's an audio book yeah. now. Uh, but yeah, it'd be nice to finally hear David Fincher talk about it because we haven't really gotten that. Uh, so I would like to see that revisited. Uh, another older film. So I, I reviewed uh, a few years back the Bram Stoker's Dracula by Coppola and the Kenneth Branagh Frankenstein. There's not a lot of behind the scenes stuff on Frankenstein that's available. The yeah. Kenneth Branagh version, there's like a making of that's on the VHS tape. Even the new uh, Blu-ray they put out doesn't have much on it. I had to hunt down the work print to even see deleted scenes. And I did a whole video on that, but I'm like, that's another one where it's like Dracula ended up so good and Frankenstein was like the complete opposite. Like it was a total failure, even though I do kind of like that movie. I would love to know like what happened on set there. What kind of fights did Coppola and Brana have? Brana was cheating on his wife with Helena Bonham Carter. Happy fun to hear. <laughs> um, it's like, oh yeah, that was a very important day for me. I was cheating on my wife at the time. I'm like, yeah, I can tell you have a lot of scenes with Helena. Let's um, take it <laughs> But yeah, that would be one that I would actually really like to see documented. But um, yeah, this was great, guys. We have two super chats here. Let me just read them real quick. Oh yeah, th- this is a good one. What what a hack! The Antonio Peluso story. That should be the name of the movie you guys are going to do on me. Um, <laughs> I I mean, we'll workshop it. Maybe you guys have a better idea. I was thinking the greatest man who ever lived. I thought that'd be a good title. <laughs> uh, we have uh, Too Scary to See You, a history of eyeball stabbing. Oh, wow. God. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so I have I have a horrible phobia of eye stabbings because I've had multiple eye issues and I had to get surgery where needles and shit went into my eye. That was after I got the eye fear. I had the eye, fear of being stabbed in the eye. I stabbed myself in the eye and then I had to have surgery on my eye. So you've got my You've got that blue underground edition of Lucio Fulci's zombie of you, the one where the woman... No, gets- you know how many people, and they're going to do it again after this fucking episode, you know how many people send me that gift just randomly, <laughs> just to be dicks? The flail, I think he made me my pen holder that's on set, which is an eyeball that's bloody that you can put pens in. <laughs> you think, you know, I tell my fans this is a horrible fear, and you think they'd be nice to me, and no. They're like, oh, Tony, I know it'll be funny. Let me send him this new 
cut uh, this new scene from a movie. Anytime I get multiple tweets of people going, hey, Tony, you're really going to like insert whatever new movies out. I'm just like, oh, there's a nice stabbing. I'm not going to watch it. <laughs> it's like that website you can look at, isn't it? Where it's about the, um, oh, does does the dog die? Does the dog live? I really should you do. You do eyeballs, don't you? I, I streamed the new Mortal Kombat and I played the story mode and there's an eye stabbing that I just, I should have been ready for and I wasn't ready for and I just started screaming during the live stream. Um, but yeah, I guess uh, before we go, if anyone has any last minute super chats they want to get in, feel free. Where can we find all of you? This is the plugging section, your socials and whatnot. And where can we find your films also? Go on, Gary, you go first. Top <laughs> of I mean, all of our documentaries are on uh, Facebook in terms of obviously web, uh, official pages, uh, Facebook, uh, Twitter, Instagram. Um, the lads have, have been start, starting to delve into TikTok now in terms of obviously promotion. Mm. Uh, our documentaries are currently streaming to Le Leviathan, Story of Hellraiser 1 and 2, Brewster, Story of uh, Fright Night, Hollywood Dreams Nightmares, and Robodoc and Pennywise are all streaming on um What's a, a screen box? Yeah, screen box in, in the US, uh, UK. Uh, we've got Hollywood Dreams Nightmares coming out in November on uh, Kaleidoscope via Icon Film Channel. Okay. On Amazon. And then also then Robocop airs episode one in the UK on Monday, this Monday coming up on the Ooh. Icon Film Channel. Always um, good, yeah. So, uh, yeah, we're about. Um, Hopefully physical. I mean, I, I can't remember dates on physicals. Eastwood has learned. <laughs> so East, what are the physical dates on our well, project? I, for Robo, I I'm not sure about um, the Englewood doc. You might know that one. For Robo, we've got October 18th for um, a Walmart steel book edition and then the collector's edition um, in America, um, which is region A. So Canadians can get a hold of that too. Um, and then it's out on the 18th of December in the UK, which is Region B, so Europe. So that's exciting. Cool. And it's got 60 minutes of special features on there. So there's there's a ton of good stuff on it. Nice. Yeah. Four, four and a half hours wasn't enough. So <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we're uh, on social media channels, I think. I can never remember if I'm dead mouse underscore Griff or Griff underscore <laughs> S88 or yeah. whatever. <laughs> <laughs> my personal home number gary <laughs> yeah, yeah you feel free to drop your address uh, <laughs> uh but yeah man this was great i really love talking to you guys it's always nice when we get like filmmakers on the show it doesn't happen often but it is a, always a fun time when that happens and uh yeah everyone should check out uh those movies actually uh, Pennywise, I think, is on Tubi right now. Uh, that's where I watch it. I know my audience really loves Tubi. It's kind of our favorite okay, streaming yeah, platform. Yeah. yeah, Tubi's great. Tubi's pretty great. Uh, but yeah, it, Tubi, Tubi has that, and they have the It movie, so you could do a double feature, uh, which is what I did. I watched. I think I messaged you, Chris. Uh -huh. I'm like, I want to watch It now. So <laughs> <laughs> that was a lot of that's Pennywise. That was a long night for you, mate. That was a very long night. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I have everyone's socials also linked in the description and links to where you, if you want, you can even purchase these films streaming or whatnot on uh, Amazon. Uh, so yeah, check that out, everyone. Oh, we got one super chat here from Gareth Evans. Uh, yeah, Steelbook, <laughs> Steelbook on my Xmas list. Okay, <laughs> cool, cool. I'll go get one from now. Oh, so he wants to. All right, cool. Thanks, Gareth. So what? You've given one ninety nine. So that, that means you get a Steelbook now, is it? All right, we'll talk afterwards. <laughs> uh but yeah thank you guys so much for coming out uh this was great and i hope to talk to you guys in the future thanks very much for having yeah, thank us you. Yeah, thank you thank you and everyone watching please like share and subscribe and hopefully we can get more people on and hopefully you know when they do the documentary about my life we'll all be back here it'll be great, it'll be great. <laughs> <laughs> all right goodbye everyone gonna thank end you. the stream now and stream <laughs>